Next speaker is uh, Autodesk President and CEO Carl Bass. Actually, Carl's a little more than our CEO. Carl is our chief maker. And if you don't believe that, um, you know, you can go take a look at his extensive and vast portfolio of creations. But Carl actually uh, takes a very hands-on approach to putting our software, design, and engineering tools through their paces. And we hear about it. We hear about how easy they are to use. And uh, so please join me in welcoming Carl Bass. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so, yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit this morning about the future of making things and just about how Autodesk is involved in my personal journey and my explorations and what I've been doing. And so I'll just walk you through a handful of things. But first, as a little background, you know, many of you may know us for the software we make. Many people may not exactly know what we do, but what Autodesk does is we make software for people who make stuff. And, you know, the three big industries we think are serving are the people who uh, design and engineer the built environment, so the roads and bridges and the buildings all around us. Secondly, it's uh, the manufactured products from airplanes to cars to consumer products. And the third one, which is not as well known often, is media and entertainment, people who make the video games and the feature length movies that we watch all the time. That's where our software is used. And so we're in this unique position and I feel kind of privileged to be in it of being able to give creative people the tools so that they can express their ideas, whether they're building things on the scale of makers or whether they're rebuilding, you know, the new Panama canal. And uh, that, that's what we do at Autodesk. Um, one of the things that we've taken an increasing interest in over the last, I'd say, three to four years is not just how to design and engineer things, but how to actually make them. You know, historically, we were really concerned with allowing people to build digital models, digital replicas of what they would eventually build. You know, it was a company that started by first, we would make them on blueprints, then we would build 3D models. But at some point we realized that the things we were helping people create were all on that side of the screen. They were behind the glass and locked up. And most of our customers said to us, our real problem is not just designing there, it's actually turning these things into the real world, actually making physical artifacts uh, because our businesses revolve around selling things in the real world. So it's great that they look awesome on the other side of the screen. What I need to do is figure out how to make that transition. And as people look to be more innovative and bring uh, products to market more quickly, the bridge between what you could make digitally and what you could make um, in physically was one of the gaps that they felt we needed to do. So we started spending more time. This is a picture of our workshop down on Embarcadero in San Francisco, a big digital fabrication facility that we use to test out ideas. We use to test our software. We get, we get to have an understanding of what our customers are doing in trying to turn those digital models into physical objects. In addition, let me talk about a couple things. I, as, um, was said in the introduction, I've made things my whole life. I've made machines and sculpture and furniture and houses. There's a handful of pictures of things that I've, I, that I've made over the years. I've also designed and built a bunch of machines. And so, um, you know, I, I haven't really stayed on the straight and narrow. It's, you know, I always see um, a request for something as an opportunity to go make it and solve a new problem. Um, I'm fortunate that my wife has put up with this. I always laugh. On the lower right is, uh, you can see this little black granite bench. So that's made out of a solid piece of granite. But the way that started out was one afternoon when my wife kind of asked and said, it would be really nice if we had a bench in the garden. And I think what she really meant is, could you go down to like Home Depot <laughs> and buy one of these things and like assemble it by this afternoon? And uh, <laughs> What I did instead was I went upstairs and I started, I, I started sketching something out. And then she came out and said, I, I thought I asked you to go to Home Depot. And it was like, I'm working on it, I'm working on it. And so nine months later, I had designed and carved, uh, you know, this, this you know, thousand, a thousand pound piece of uh, black granite. Um, here, let me show you a couple other things that I've worked on lately. This is a go-kart that my, uh, Fifth, then 15 year old son design. So this is an electric go-kart. It's got a 19 horsepower motor. It goes, uh, right now it's geared to go maybe 60 miles an hour. 
By the way, 60 miles an hour when you're two inches off the ground feels incredibly fast. Um, it also has no suspension, suspension or no differential. So you skid around all the corners and you feel every bump. So 60 feels super fast. Um, what we've done lately to it, and you can kind of see in the front, there's this big red contraption on the front of it. That is part of taking our electric go-kart and making it autonomous. So this is, uh, what we did is we were one day, we were driving the go-kart and testing it, and we had a drone following it around and just recording the driving of it. And then we said, that's kind of cool that the drone can follow it, but what if the drone actually could drive it? So we transplanted the guts of uh, one of the 3D robotics drones, and we put it inside the go-kart, and that's a servo motor on the front that actually steers, that steers the go-kart. Um, here's another project I've been working on lately. This is, um, you heard a lot about metal 3D printing from the folks at Shapeways. They do awesome printing. Um, but if you go up and you get a quote on anything metal printed from anybody, you'll quickly realize the cost. Uh, particularly metal printers, you know, they start out with price tags of a couple hundred thousand dollars. And they, in order to print, you use uh, metal powders. This instead is my attempt at a metal printer, which is a repurposed MIG welder that's held on a gantry. And so the, the, these are objects that are about this high that are made from a MIG welder. And the one that's about this high prints in 30 minutes. So what I think is cool is everybody gets all excited about their MakerBot. But like I can print something out of steel or aluminum or bronze faster than someone can print something on a MakerBot. And it's actually made out of metal. So this is kind of a fun experiment that you know, we keep pursuing. And um, folks at Autodesk are doing some similar stuff. And you know we're collaborating with people around the world. This is one of these interesting things that's been going on for years, but um, it's interesting to go from idea to turning into a reality. And so hopefully people will have access to metal printers for thousands of dollars or hopefully hundreds of dollars instead of hundreds of thousands of dollars. OK, um, let me talk about where I think things are going and where at Autodesk we're spending our time. And when we look out to the horizon, um, you know, a couple of years ago, we looked and we said, what is dramatically changing in the world of design and engineering? And we said, the single biggest thing that will affect what's going on um, is the ability to access the cloud. And essentially, it was take as much computing power as I could possibly get and apply it to an engineering problem with the question, if I had all the computing power in the world available to me instantaneously, how would I design and engineer things differently? So that was kind of the, que the question that we were asking ourselves. And then we said, there's this other thing going on in which we're looking at the world and we're saying, there's something fundamentally changing in how software is created. And all that, you know, I've been involved in professional software development for way too many years. You know, I look out and it's, you know, like I've been involved longer than you've been alive. But um, the one thing that was always true in how we develop software is when we ship software, it never got better. There was only one way it got better, is we would replace the hardware. So if we shipped a piece of software and then you got a new CPU or a better graphics card or more bandwidth, your programs could actually run better. What's going on now with machine learning is actually fundamentally changing this. This is the first time ever where we are now shipping computer code algorithms that the more data they're exposed to, the better they get. This is, this is a dramatic difference. So you combine this thing of I have virtually infinite amount of computing, I have as much data as I can access, and I have techniques to do machine learning, and what is that creating? And so one of the things that we saw is this idea of doing generative design. And generative design was this idea of asking the computer to kind of be a co-designer, to participate in the act of designing along with the designer and engineer, as opposed to just merely being a way to document a design or to test the design. This is a way to interact with the designer and an explore a design space that was larger than any of us can explore individually. Most design spaces are complicated, multivariate design spaces. We can't wrap our head around exactly what's going on. We try a handful of solutions so we run out of time or money or patience, and then we move on from there and say, good enough. And so the interesting thing is if you have something powerful enough and you can run hundreds or millions or billions of calculations, how would you do this differently? Here, for example, this is a heat exchanger that was designed by the computer. And instead, uh, and what the big difference here is when I say designed by the computer, 
what we specified as the designer is things like, here's the space I want it to occupy, here's the volume, here's the thermodynamic requirements, here are the materials, and it goes off and against known tests tries to optimize. And so what you get in the end is something that I think is, I know to be nearly optimal in terms of its engineering characteristics, and I happen to think that this is also beautiful. And so it's really interesting what this interaction between person and machine is. Here's, an, here's another example, some work we did with Boeing, where we were trying to imagine the future of aviation. And in the same way, you can see the inside, the inside of what this aircraft would be. And one of the things, I love this idea of making the structure visible. Um, you know, that you, you can immediately see which parts of the aircraft are important. You know, just because we used to design them to look like submarines doesn't mean we will always need to design them to look like submarines. Um, you know, and what we did there is we just ran a series of tests and figured out where the forces are. And so in some ways, this is, you know, this is a great example of form follows forces. You know, people talk about form following function. This is form following forces. And if you look here, maybe. Okay, so one of the things is when you try to imagine the future of air travel, getting a new commercial aircraft to fly is actually a very difficult endeavor because of all the regulatory challenges. You know, you have that problem, you have 150 people on board, you make a mistake, kind of a, a big hurdle to overcome. So we said instead, let's find a part that we can actually work on. And so we chose that D-shaped partition over there, and we said, let's just work on that and see if we can do that because we will be able to fly that in our lifetime. A new airframe might take substantially longer. So we went and we, so we, went and we used generative de design techniques to come up with a lighter and stronger panel to fit that. This is, this is actually it. Uh, this is it being shown on stage at Autodesk University last year. Um, one of the things that I found incredibly interesting during this process is we got it to the strength that they had required and substantially lighter. And then they said, could you make it lighter? And we said, yeah, but probably not a meter spec. And they said, you know, we came up with the spec. We said, no, no idea. They said, well, we had built one about 30 years ago and we tested it and that became the spec. And so I think that's a lot of what goes on out there is lots of things are overbuilt and people don't really understand what the real limitations are. So we went and we redesigned one that did meet the spec. Um, and then we tested it, and it's, it so far has gone through, I believe, a 9G test, and now it's going through like a 16 or 18G test, and then it'll be ready to commercially fly. And this will be one of the first um, 3D metal printed, but also generatively designed parts that actually flies in a commercial aircraft. So I'm excited about, I'm, I'm excited about this, and this is the kind of project you can do in that time frame. That airframe, which is totally cool, it's probably going to take a bunch more years before it actually flies. Um, here's some of the parts coming out of the printer. Here's one, I just want to talk about this quickly, because once you get excited about generative design and 3D printing, and just so it's clear, most of my interest, people thought we got interested in 3D printing and then later generative design, but it's exactly the opposite. My interest in it came from generatively designed things that were too difficult to fabricate any other way. And so 3D printing, you know, as was mentioned, the shape complexity is free. Doesn't matter what it comes up with, we can generally fabricate it. One of the limitations of 3D printing, and this is what we're trying to overcome here, is that things go up as the, to the third power. They go up as the cube, you know, so you make something twice as big and it generally costs eight times as much, it takes eight times as long. So one of the things is, this is a Project Escher we're working on, in which we have multiple print heads working on a similar machine. And you can have an arbitrary number of N by M heads working. And I think we are going to increasingly need ways to do parallelism uh, to overcome some of the limitations. You know, when you're, in the, when you're in the world of digital, getting parallelism is easy. Once you're in the physical world, it becomes a lot more difficult. But anyhow, th this is one of the things that's done that way. I think it's an interesting investigation. Let me, let me move on to this other thing, where when you talk about generative design and you want to get the input parameters that are actually necessary, where you say to the engineer, describe what's needed, oftentimes we have, you know, canonical versions, we have idealized versions of what's necessary. Here we hi um, can we go back and do that again? I don't, let's see if we can start that slide over. Do I get it? Red one real hard. 
I never knew you had to press with one of these things hard. Okay, let, and now let's go forward. Okay, so this is this is a group down in LA called the Bandito Brothers, and what we who do crazy stunt driving, and we said, rather than imagining what the requirements are, why don't we send them out, we'll build a vehicle, we'll send them out and drive it, we will put instrumentation all over it, and we will measure it, and that will become the input. And so this is an interesting tie between how do you do the Internet of Things and the ability to capture data about how stuff is made, and then how we do generative design. So that's the Bandito brothers driving things, probably as hard as anyone's ever going to drive them. Here's, a, here's the vehicle. Here's the instrumentation going on it. So, you know, cheap and available sensors everywhere. There they, there they are feeling, you know, um, potentiometers at the joints and four sensors. And there they, there, they, there they are taking this vehicle out to the desert. There's their seventh day of testing and really giving it a workout. And every bit of data is recorded. And so then we, then we take that data back. Remember, we have infinite amount of computing. And what we're going to try to design is a frame that's ideal for the conditions that this was under. So you get, you get the driving. Here's the evolutionary algorithm working to design the frame. And so it, it's, it's walking through, and it's adding material and removing material as appropriate to try to optimize the structure. Here's one form of it in one metal. So I think this is the chromoly version of it. And this is the titanium version of it. So just think about a completely new way to engineer and design things. Instead of matching stuff, we actually build prototypes. We go out to the field and we measure completely. We then co-design with the computer something completely different. So if I was to put this side by side with, you know, just take your standard, whether it's doom buggy or F-250 frame, you know, made out of I-beams, and compare it to this and think of how optimal this is. And over the next couple of years, as people realize that there is infinite computing power and that we have this ability to use machines with learning algorithms to process huge amounts of data, the, the way we design and engineer things and eventually how we make them will completely change. Here you go. Let's just watch this last little evolution of the form. I have nothing else. The one thing I know is I won't want to draw that by hand. So <laughs> thank you, everybody. Right, cool. So, Carl, we have students all over the world right now, watch parties. They're uh, eating pizza and let's see, pizza on the East Coast and bagels yep. on the West Coast and not exactly sure about AU Brazil. But um, <laughs> what advice do you have for, uh, for young students and, you know, preparing themselves to, to be able to go out and join industry and, and, and drive innovation? What would, what, as a coach, what would, you, uh, what would you tell somebody entering school today or maybe somebody at the capstone level? So what I, I, one piece of advice I have for everybody who's interested in this is build as many things as you can. I'm a huge fan of the just-in-time learning. Um, I think we have a crazy educational system in which we go and, you know, you're, ex you're expected to read a book on fluid dynamics, on thermodynamics, on statics, on, and eventually, maybe lucky in the fourth year, you get to build something. And more likely, you know, as a graduate student or an intern, I think the experience that comes from actually trying and kind of the, the joy you find in solving problems is really the special thing. So I would say do it as many times as you possibly can. That's what builds the skill. You know, and if you were to compare it like something else, here's how I think we unfortunately teach engineering in too many places. It would be like saying to a musician, for the next 12 years, you're going to just practice scales. And in the 13th year, we'll let you play Mary Had a Little Lamb. And it's crazy because the joy of music and the reason why I want to become more skilled is because there's something there in it for me. And I think many of the people who enter, and so I would just encourage people to build as many things as you can, you know, get involved with, you know, the, the, the clubs on engineering campuses, you know, build F1s and Bajas and whatever, whatever else. It doesn't really matter. It's just that thing of having a problem and working through it. And the one thing I will say, having built dozens of things, um, 
every single time, I can't think of a single time I built something that if I knew at the beginning what I, what I know at the end, I wouldn't do something differently. And I think, you know, the more experience you can have doing that, um, it, just makes, it just makes you a better designer and engineer. Excellent. How about in the, uh, the crowd here at the gallery in San Francisco? Questions for Carl. Here we go. Does, okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. So the question is, um, does Dreamcatcher become available anytime soon? And for those who are watching, a lot of the stuff that was done with the Banditos Brothers Project um, is a piece of experimental software we have called Dreamcatcher. And yes, yeah, so the first parts of like generative design and some of the optimization stuff, you'll first start seeing in Fusion this year, and then other parts of Dreamcatcher will come out there, you know, as they get ready. Um, you know, early on with this stuff, it's we're still trying to figure out, you know, how usable it is, what it is, you know, what it can be done, what can be done with it. But like, for example, uh, two of my colleagues just designed a really interesting chair with Dreamcatcher and then fabricated it on a, C, on a CNC router. And so, you know, in, in addition to aerospace and automotive, kind of more practical, approachable objects. So, yeah, I'm really excited about what's going on. I can't wait to get it out. You know, it's not quite ready for prime time. But, like, the more people that get their hands on it, the better as far as I'm concerned. Very cool. Uh, question from Matthew on Twitter, Carl. And it's how will machine learning affect the ideation process? <sighs> You know, I think, look, I, I think it's a hugely interesting question. Like I said, I've never seen such a profound change in how software is being done. And if you look at many of the interesting problems out there, or some of them solve speech recognition, how we search for things, how people check our credit cards, um, how we're going to solve the boundary conditions and autonomous driving, those are perfect examples of where machine learning is being done. This is some of the first attempts to bring some of the machine learning into the realm of designing and engineering. What I think that's interesting about machine learning is that it actually enables you to find solutions that you didn't previously conceive. And up until now, with purely deterministic software, that was not possible. There, there, there was no whimsy. There was no serendipity. Things just didn't happen. It was only what you put in the beginning could really come out at the end. And this, this, for the first time, is a fundamental shift in being able to get stuff that we can't imagine. It's, it's why I talk about it as being some kind of cooperative relationship in which designers and architects and engineers may become as much curators and directors as they do as the active participants. And before people get real worried, Look, I don't think most engineers really went to school, you know, to, you know, to run CAD programs doing 11th grade geometry. You know, I think people are interested in solving problems and making things and uh, doing important work. And so I think there's plenty of work left to be done. And we just have to recognize that we have probably the most powerful tool we've ever had, you know, to, to, start, harness it, to start harnessing the computer. Excellent. Okay, well, thanks a lot. Let's give it up for Carl.